Hi, my name is Brian Patrick. I'm the business manager for Great Falls Public Schools. And the purpose of the following presentation, entitled School Funding 101, is to provide a general overview and background on the basic components and terminology used when discussing school funding. Funding public education in Montana is an ever-changing process because, among other reasons, it's adjusted every two years at the legislative session in Helena. The basic framework for the terminology used in school finance and the history and process behind how schools in Montana are funded today will be presented. There will be links to additional resources for both school funding and the finances for Great Falls Public Schools at the conclusion of this overview. There are a variety of factors which influence funding for schools in Montana. Every two years, the legislature meets in Helena. The legislature's responsibility is to fund state government. School funding is a major component of that discussion. For perspective purposes, it's important to understand that over the course of time, our state has experienced everything from very good economic times to the reverse of that when we have encountered recessions as well as everything in between. There have been both Democratic and Republican governors. The Republican and Democratic parties have controlled both the House and Senate, and at times has each controlled either the Senate or the House of Representatives and the governorship. Each of these unique combinations has had an impact on funding for schools. Local voters also impact school funding when they are asked to approve local operational levies. The scale in the middle of this diagram represents the legal system. The Montana judicial system has played a vital role in ensuring equitable funding for Montana students. We also live in a large rural state which has very big school districts as well as one-room country schools. State laws which pertain to school funding are mandated to provide an equitable funding system for schools, like Great Falls High School and small schools that may only have four students. The complexity of our school funding system is created by striving to treat all schools in an equitable manner. School funding has a variety of terms as is demonstrated on this picture. Please note that these terms are currently all mixed up. At the conclusion of this presentation, hopefully, items like base budget, maximum budget, reserves, and cash flow, and how these terms relate to school funding will be clearer as they relate to state statewide school funding system. To begin to comprehend the school funding system in place today, it is important to understand the impact two lawsuits have sh that have shaped school funding. The first of these, dating back to 1989, has become known as the Lobel decision. The second major court decision became known as the Sherlock decision. This came from the case Columbia Falls versus Montana. School funding basics and terminology, including minimum and maximum budget, came from these two significant cases. The general fund budget is the main source of funding for general operation of schools. It comprises approximately 80% of all the operations for a district. In setting the stage for understanding the terminology for discussing the general fund budget, there are two terms, base budget and maximum budget, which are key to understanding the school funding system. As these terms are discussed, it's important to note that student enrollment plays a significant role in determining the operational funding for the district. An acronym you may hear associated with student enrollment is ANB, which stands for Average Number Belonging. ANB is the official enrollment for the district determined by a formula that includes the average of three student count dates during the school year. In order to better realize the context of the 1989 lawsuit, it is important to understand that at the time there were schools in the state that had the best of everything because there was a lot of wealth in that particular community or district. This wealth, more than likely, came from a major industry or natural resource such as oil. Because of this wealth, these schools had new computer labs, which in 1989 was a very big deal. They also had brand new textbooks, the facilities were the best, they were able to offer a wide variety of programs. On the other side of the issue were districts that operated with very limited funding. Because these districts had a taxable valuation which was substantially lower, local mills raised, local mills raised fewer dollars in comparison to support the school. A district with very low taxable valuation would have, a levy, have to levy a lot more mills to raise the same amount of money and individual taxpayers generally paid more because there were fewer businesses to help shoulder the load. At the time, in comparison, a district with very poor wealth had old textbooks, no computers, poor equipment, and very basic programming. 
The lawsuit was originated by a group of poor districts who indicated that the funding for schools in the state was not equitable. Students in the richer districts were gaining significant advantage over the students from poorer districts. The purpose of this slide is to demonstrate that there was a substantial difference in the amount spent per pupil in the state at the time. Each number represents a school district and the average amount of money spent per student in that partic particular district. It is important to note that the dollars listed on this slide are for explanation purposes only. As you view this information, it can be determined that at the top of the chart there were high per pupil spending districts. At the bottom of this chart are districts who spent much less, with many districts in our state that fell between these two extremes. It's e easy to see that there was a substantial range of money spent on a per student basis. The first step the state took to analyze and rectify this situation was to determine the average amount spent per pupil for the entire state. As is demonstrated in this diagram, the total spent per student in the state was divided by the number of students. This dollar amount, represented by the line on the picture, become, became known as the maximum budget or 100%. The maximum budget is a key term in school funding and it's important to understand that it was not the maximum being spent but the average of what all schools were spending at the time. In addressing the equitable spending among districts in the state, another measure taken to address the difference between the high spending districts and the low spending districts was to create an expenditure range that brought all districts closer together. This was completed by creating a range between the average spent in the state and 80% of that average. The 80% line became known as the base budget. All schools were mandated to be between the base budget and the maximum budget. In this illustration, the amounts below the base budget line were required to grow within three years to the base or 80% amount. A combination of state aid and a mandatory local levy helped ensure that schools were at least at the base budget. Conversely, the schools above the 100% or average were required to reduce budgets until they were below or at the maximum budget or 100% line. Guaranteed tax base, another school funding term, was another measure taken to help the counties with low taxable valuation equalize. The same concept was used in that the average of all county taxable valuations was determined by adding them all together and dividing by the total counties. If a county's average was below the state average, then the state would assist in payments to schools that would help bring them up to that average. This slide demonstrates that if the taxable valuation in a county was below the state average, then the state would help equalize the funding for schools by the amount that the county was below the state average. At this point, it is important to review the basic structure of the general fund budget by applying the items presented previously. The maximum budget for schools was determined by averaging the state spending per pupil. The base budget is 20% less than the maximum budget, which means that it is at 80% of the average spent per student in the state. The budget amount, which was greater than 80% level or base budget level, became known as an over-base budget. For those schools that were below the base, they were mandated to increase their budgets to the base amount. If their taxable valuation was below the state average, the state provided additional assistance in the form of guaranteed tax base, or GTB, to help them get to that base amount. Direct state aid is generated from two major funding components. The first component is based on the number of students in the district. For each elementary student, the current payment from the state is $5,120. For a high school student, the payment is $6,555. Because there is some efficiency and economy of scale for educating students, meaning that the more students a district has, it becomes easier to balance the needs for all students. This system includes a 50 cent reduction for each student after the first one. It's important to, know, to note that the school funding system has evolved over time to equitably provide funding for both very large and very small districts. Another component of direct state aid is a payment for a school building. To provide more balance to the funding formula, there's a state payment related to a school building. Originally, this was to recognize the fact that it does cost money to operationally to maintain the school building. Currently, districts receive $40,000 for an elementary school, 
$80,000 for a middle school and $290,000 for a high school. Up until the last legislative session, only one payment was made to a district for a school, regardless of how many schools were in the district. For example, Great Falls has 15 elementary schools, but only received one payment of $40,000. Senate Bill 175 in the last legislative session allowed for school districts with more than one operating high school or elementary building to collect payments for those buildings. This is one more look at the basic breakdown of the base and maximum budgets. An important concept to understand is that the state and local money are used to ensure that all districts in the state are at the base budget. All money above the base budget for schools must come from local taxpayers. This money is generated by previous mill levies and new mill levies. Any tuition amounts paid to school districts are also applied to the over base budget. Now we'll talk about money that comes directly from the state. <laughs> state funding for schools is determined by a number of components which are mainly student related. It is important to remember that the funding formula had to address equalizing funding for every school size in the state. A fundamental concept that is very important to keep in mind as school funding is discussed is that it is primarily driven by the number of students in the school. The major component that the state uses to pay schools is direct state age, which is direct state aid, which is a payment for the number of students who are attending the school as well as a payment amount for the specific school building. Other payment categories included in direct state aid are amounts for special education and a quality educator payment, which is for the number of certified teachers and licensed professionals. There's also funding on a per student basis to provide instruction on Indian education for all, money for the number of Native American students to help address the Native American Indian achievement gap. There's also been a funding component for schools to help them in to help implement programs for at-risk students. Finally, if the taxable valuation of a district is below the state average, guaranteed tax, pay guaranteed tax base payments are made to districts to get to base level funding. To help better understand the specifics on how state and local revenues apply to Great Falls Public Schools, this diagram breaks out the funding components for the 2014-2015 school year. In the yellow section of the diagram are categories for direct state aid. The tan section is the amount of mandatory local mills and guaranteed tax base aid that the district is required to levy for the base budget. The red section is the area between the base budget and 100%. This section of funding, also called the over base budget, comes directly from local taxpayers through voted levies and tuition that is paid out to district students who attend school in our district. The state does not provide any funding for schools in this area. All money comes directly from the local taxpayers in the form of local levies which have been approved by the voters. The elementary budget is $44,930,778, which is $671,483 below the maximum budget. It's the diagram that's on the left of the screen. The high school budget on the right Total budget is $22,470,047, which is the maximum budget amount. This means that for the 2014-15 school year, the elementary could have asked for an additional $671,483. The high school, being at the maximum budget amount, could not have requested any more additional money on a local levy. The second major legal decision which impacted school funding is known as the Sherlock decision. It has to do with the amount of money the state provides schools. A coalition, a coalition of schools in the state joined together as the Montana Quality Education Coalition to sue the state because it was not providing adequate support for funding Montana public schools. Article 10, Section 1 of the Montana Constitution requires that the state provide adequate funding for Montana public schools. This diagram demonstrates the pattern of state support which prompted the second major lawsuit on school funding in Montana. This bar graph, starting in 1991, indicates that the state provided 72.44% of the general fund budget funding for schools across the state. Over the course of the next 14 years, that percentage had dropped to a little over 60%. 
During this nearly decade and a half, costs to operate schools continued to increase. With less support from the state, school districts were increasingly going to their local voters in the form of mill levy requests to make up the difference. As the premise of this legal action was that the state was not providing its adequate share of funding to operate schools. As you can see by the chart, over the course of the next six years, the state share of funding schools in Montana increased. Have you ever wondered how the state spends its budget? This diagram demonstrates the trend in spending for the state of Montana from 2000 to 2010 by looking at the percentage of state budget allocated to the major functions of state government. In 2000, schools in Montana received roughly 43% of the Montana budget. Public Health and Human Services, 21%. The rest of state government, just under 16%. Higher education came in at a little over 11%, and prisons were at 8.21%. Over the course of the next decade, the percent spent for public education decreased by just under 11% to 32.72% of the budget. The rest of state government increased by 13.39% to 29.10%. Public Health and Human Services decreased by 1.87%. Higher Education decreased by 2.14% and Prisons increased by about a percent and a half. Each August, the trustees of each school district are required by law to adopt the budgeted funds of the district. These include the general, transportation, bus depreciation, tuition, retirement, adult education, non-operating, technology, flexibility, and building reserve funds. A budgeted fund is any fund for which a budget must be officially adopted by the Board of Trustees in order to expend money from the fund. This comes from the Montana Code Annotated 20-9-201A. The funds highlighted in red are funds that do not pertain to Great Falls Public Schools because we do not own our own buses and we are an operating district. The question has been asked, what percent of the school budget comes from the state? This slide illustrates the percent of revenue for all but the budgeted funds for our district. It's important to note that this discussion has shifted to all budgeted funds, not specifically the general fund budget. For all budgeted funds in 2014, the state provided 61.42% of the revenue for the Great Falls Public School District. The county supplied 11.63% and the remaining 26.95% came from local taxpayers. The county portion applies only to the retirement fund and transportation fund as portions of the law specifically apply to each of these funds. All budgeted funds for the Great Falls School District for the 2014-15 school year total $82,926,403. As indicated earlier in this presentation, the general fund budget is approximately 80% of the total budget for districts across the state. Its purpose for the, is for the general operation of the district. For our district, the general fund budget is 81.28% or $67,400,825 of all the budgeted funds. Transportation, which is the amount paid for transporting our students to and from school, comprises 4.36% or $3,612,554 of the total. The retirement budget, which pays for mandatory pension requirements, is just over 11% of total state funding for the district. The technology fund collects $150,000 per year for the elementary district and $75,000 per year for the high school district in the form of a district-wide levy. The remaining budgets of adult education, building reserve, and flexibility account for $1,254,598 or 1.52% of the total budgeted funds for the district. There are a number of moving parts that impact the operation of a school district and the amount, of local, the amount local taxpayers fund schools. The general fund budget is not exactly the same each year. There are a number of variables which determine the general fund budget amount. If the student enrollment increases, the budget will increase since it's one of the major drivers which determine budget. There are usually legislative changes every two years that impact the amount of funding schools receive. The taxable valuation, also known as the value of the local mill or property value of the district, helps determine how much local taxpayers will pay. As you've seen from our previous slide, state support for schools varies. The value of our local property also determines the amount of guaranteed tax base money the district will receive. If our, property taxes in if our property increases in value more than the state average, 
we will receive less guaranteed tax base money. Other moving parts include the impact that inflation has on our operations and health insurance cost increases. Finally, the outcome of a local mill levy elections impact the amount of money available for the operation of the school district. Now to spend a minute on reserves and why they're needed. Um, it all has to do with the school district cash flow. Um, if you think about it, there's two big paydays for schools. Um, when local taxpayers pay their taxes in November and May, that money comes to the school. The rest of the months of the year, except for July, uh, the amount of money that's designated for direct state aid is paid to the school district. This chart shows the cash flow for the Great Falls Public Schools and it's in tens of thousands of dollars. So if we look at July, there's revenue of 181 and expenses of $809. Uh, if we personalize this to our own personal accounts, um, it would be if we had an income of $181 and expenses of 809 you can see as you go through the year that August, we have revenue of $2,000, expenses of $1,200. September, um, the revenue is again $2,232, expenses of $3,337. You can see the expenses stay roughly about the same throughout the course of the rest of the year except for June. Although if you look at November and May, you can see that the tax money comes in um, in November at $10,774 and May $9,305. This chart demonstrates what was just discussed as far as the numbers. In July, the district receives no money, and then in August, the state money starts to come in until November when there is no state money, but it's replaced by tax dollars from local taxpayers, and then December through April, through March and April, um, is again the state money divided equally. Um, in May you can see that tax dollars come in again and then June that falls off. This slide demonstrates the expenditures by month. You can see in July there's very few expenditures. Um, they roughly relate to the payroll for the employees that work year-round. Um, in August when school starts you can see that, uh, that it increases and then from September generally through May, you know, somewhat level as far as expenditures. And then in May what happens is um, all the items that need to be purchased for the next school year, including textbooks and classroom supplies and, and those types of things are purchased, as well as major projects are done in the district um, to replace a roof, um, to replace a boiler. Um, the summer is a time when it's best to work on the major projects in the school because the students are not um, in the buildings. This slide demonstrates um, an overlay of both revenues and expenditures. You can see um, the blue line is the expenditures and the green line are the, the revenues. Um, you can see how um, they don't balance out. It's not like um, there's a consistent paycheck if, if we were per to personalize it, there's no consistent paycheck every month where the expenses and revenues are exactly the same. And um, basically the reason for a reserve is because in the time when there's uh, expenditures that exceed revenues, uh, that money is used to cover those expenses. Since schools are governmental agencies, they are required to follow national governmental accounting standards. A section of these standards pertain to reserves and classify them into general categories. These categories have been created to help the public better understand the limitations and uses of reserves. These categories of reserves are classified to include non-spendable, restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. The first category, non-spendable, relates to the type of reserve that is included in the audit that, like its name, is non-spendable. The items that are in this category include inventory or an endowment or scholarship fund. The scholarship funds are generally given to a school with the requirements that the district being only able to spend the interest generated by the fund. Even though these items are not in the form of spendable cash, they show up on the district financial balance sheet and are an important component of the balance sheet and audit each year. The second category is restricted. This refers to a variety of funds that have certain restrictions on how they can be spent. The funds are generally established by legislation, which is specific to the use of the money. 
A good example is the Transportation Fund, which is established by law to be used to transport students to and from school. The money is restricted only for that use and cannot be used for other purposes, such as a teacher's salary. The third major category is committed. Funds in this category are not restricted or non-spendable. These funds are constrained for a specific purpose by the highest level of decision-making authority, which is the school board. The money that's in this category is the general fund budget reserves, which by law cannot be spent without a resolution from the board, which then is approved by the Office of Public Instruction. The purpose for these funds include cash flow or emergency situations outlined specifically in law. The next category is entitled Assigned. These are funds that the district intends to use. The school board can designate an official of the district the authority to spend the funds. And the last major category is unassigned. The definition of this category is general fund budget money only which is available for any purpose. The reality of how this plays out for schools is, it, is the amount of money available at the very end of the fiscal year which goes back to reduce taxes for the next school year. Included in this slide for your information are the 2014 ending fund balances for Great Falls Public Schools. They are broken out into the broad categories just described. The major categories are also color coded for your convenience in distinguishing them apart. The flexibility in spending for these funds is very stringent on the top and becomes more flexible as they move from restricted to committed to assigned. You may note that there are a few asterisks by certain funds in the restricted section. This means that the funds by definition fall into that particular category by definition, but are allowed to be spent in a more flexible manner. An excellent resource for learning more about Montana school funding is entitled Understanding Montana School Finance and School District Budgets. The link indicated on this page will allow you to access this very informative brochure provided by the Montana Office of Public Instruction. If you are interested in learning more about the finances for Great Falls Public Schools or have specific questions about the information provided in this presentation, feel free to contact me by phone at 268-6050 or email at brian underscore patrick at gfps.k12.mt.us there are additional resources located on the district webpage at the address listed. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about Montana school funding and the Great Falls Public Schools budget information.